Scared to death is explicit in every way. Please take care while listening. Whether thou art a ghost that hath come from the earth, or a phantom of night that hath no home, or one that lieth dead in the desert, or a ghost unburied, or a demon, or a ghoul, whatever thou be until thou art removed, thou shalt find here no water to drink. Thou shalt not stretch forth thy hand to our own. Into our house enter thou not. Through our fence break through thou not. We are protected, though we may be frightened. Our life you may not steal, though we may be scared to death. Welcome to Scared to Death, Creeps, Peepers, Roberts, and Annabelles. I'm Dan. Hello, Dan. Hello, you're Lindsay. I Hey! Nailed it. Good job. <laughs> you're a smart one. Uh, a couple quick announcements, and then we are into another show. Uh, I have a quick merch announcement to make. Um, two awesome new collections in the store. Tell me all about it. It's just a lot this week. Adjoining Mothman in the store this week is his hot sister, Moth Woman. <laughs> She's so cute, we put her on a notebook, a uh, pint glass, in addition to a tea and long sleeve option. Uh, Logan put a nice little butt on her. So she got some junk in the trunk. Uh, you know, need to order one of these for myself. Excuse you. Uh, we have another collection, new, cool, interesting, wild tea design. Sent oh in by God. Creeper Meredith Messenger. It is so good. And sorry if I'm uh, Meredith... Uh, Messenger, per- perhaps. It looks like French, but it's like oh. M-E-S-S-I-G-N-E-R. So, Messinier, perhaps? But I don't see the I in there. Just call her Deborah Messing. It's fine. But, but Mer- Meredith, I nail in your first name. Um, we put it on a T, Tumblr, notebook. Uh, thanks for sending that in. So cool. And uh, and Logan has a few words about art uh, submissions from fans. Okay, let's hear it. Yeah, I just want to let everybody uh, who is an artist out there, if you have anything that you're working on and you want to submit it, uh, to the podcast to either be on merch or maybe on socials or whatever, uh, go ahead and submit that directly to me. That's just Logan at the spicy And Great. then, uh, yeah, just show me what you got and we can start chatting. Cool. Thanks, thank you, Logan. Logan. So yeah, send it to Logan at the spicy Perfect. And again, thank you, Meredith, for your submission. Yeah. It just like, it was, it happened so organically. I was like, Oh my God, I love this. I want to put this yeah. on merch. Like she just sent it in. It's like, Hey, I was listening and I made this and I just, it's, I love it. I just loved it. <laughs> uh, and you can check it all out at badmagicmerch.com. And before uh, Lindsay mentions the uh, the charity again this month, um, one more time, just going to take a, uh, then I'll take a break for a little while. Comedy tour announcement. It's just that important, you guys. Like we just like really yeah. need to like show up and support Dan in this other medium that you don't know him in. Like it's a, we can talk about it in a bonus episode, but yeah. like as a comic, like making it to the theater that's the fucking goal. That's the fucking yeah. dream. And he made it. And so we just need you guys to like come out and show these theaters that like he's fucking got it. Ah, uh, thanks, baby. Um, you got two uh, tours coming up. It's clubs this fall. Uh, first theater tour this winter uh, for the Symphony of Insanity Club dates. You can go to dancummins.tv. Um, I'm going to be in uh, South Florida. I'm going to be in Boston, Grand Rapids, Michigan, Austin, Texas, Louisville, Kentucky, Portland, Oregon, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And again, that's dancummins.tv. Then the Burn It All Down Theater Tour is uh, starting in January, and that's going to be uh, Spokane, uh, Boise, Kansas City, St. Louis, Sacramento, Denver, San Antonio, Dallas, Vancouver, Canada. First show in Canada in years. I'm fighting for them to let him in. <laughs> Seattle, Pontiac, uh, which is just outside of Detroit, Michigan, Indianapolis, New Orleans. First show in New Orleans ever. <laughs> ever. Uh, Philadelphia, Cleveland, and Columbus. So I'm just over here laughing because I was like, I, I interjected with like, yeah. I'm fighting for them to let him in. And then my brain immediately went to let him in. <laughs> and so someone's maybe someone's knocking it low. Someone's ringing the bell. <laughs> so if you, you were at summer camp, you know. So again, go to dancummins.tv for all those. And uh, yeah, really hope to see you at some stand-up shows. I hope to see you too. And now I have this month's charity announcement. Uh, just as always, we're recording a few weeks in advance to make sure we never miss an episode. That we're always timely. And so I don't have the amount yet. But this month we are making a yet-to-be-determined donation to Kids Rock Cancer in St. Louis in honor of Jeff Burton. Jeff was a longtime staple on the Rizzuto show, a show that has supported Dan and Time Yeah, Suck great show. Great group of guys. And Bad Magic for a long, long time. Uh, Jeff recently passed away after his own grueling fight against cancer, during which, while he was fighting, he made it a priority to raise money for Kids Rock Cancer, raising over $35,000. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's an innovative program that helps kids successfully cope with the unique emotional challenges that come with a cancer yep. diagnosis. If you'd like to learn more, you can go to kidsrockcancer.org. And uh, 
just if everybody could just take a moment to just send some good energy, some good vibes to Jeff's family. He was just 55 years old. He survived by his wife, Julie, and their two daughters, Abby and Casey, who are no doubt missing him. Yeah. And he was a staple for like three decades, I believe, in the St. Louis area on the radio. So yeah. a lot of people grew up with him. Yep. 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 Uh, how many stories do you have for us today? And which ones are, what are they about? I don't know if you're going to believe me. Yeah. You have two. I have two. Okay. Like, I, I know. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Was like, th- just so insane. And you said last week that one of them uh, takes place along the Appalachian Trail. Yes. So my first story, uh, a little glitch in the matrix. Okay. Maybe. what the, A building that was there, but then isn't there. <laughs> All right. So, I like that. That's yeah, different. It is different. And I love this story from an anonymous fan in Portland. So super into that. And then my second story along the Appalachian Trail, uh, a father, son, couple friends hunting, and uh, they see a little something interesting. Okay, so the first, so the building glitch, not Appalachian, no. but the father son story is. Uh-huh. I got it. Okay. Um, I have my normal two. Oh my um, gosh, can't believe it. And the first, I don't want to spoil what it's about. One of the subjects that creeps us both out the most. And like with the doll story last week, it's something we haven't talked about much recently. Okay. So, um, uh, young man haunted by something. At his family's Montana lake cabin. This is what I mentioned last week, a story, you know, set near Kalispell. Okay. Uh, for, for many years. And then the second story is the legend of Goatman's Bridge. So who or what is the goat man? And how did he or it come to haunt a little rural area of Texas? Uh, some pretty, you know, um, intense and horrible history with this. Okay. That is real. Uh, and then and then the lore. So I'll share the uh, bunch of ghostmen. Ghost man origin lore stories and then several supposed encounters. Oh, ghost man? Yeah, I say ghost man, but ghost man. I Just, thought you yeah. said goat man. Oh, I'm sorry, goat. I was supposed to say goat. And then I started saying goat. Yeah, goat is in the animal. Okay. Goat man. Goat, goat man, man was, bridge and like, then the goat man. I thought, yeah. I thought ghost man. Well, that's like a unoriginal <laughs> name. No. The goat man. The goat man. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad we cleared that up. Okay, you ready? Uh, you ready to get ready. going after, after the socks? I'm almost ready. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay, uh-huh. I got these bat socks on. Oh, I like those, yeah. No, they're fun. I got a whole package of socks. Thank you. The, the, like the little bat reminds me of the little tiny tattoo that I was that Will X had me give him. Oh my uh, god. When he was here giving us tattoos. I, I still can't believe you tattooed somebody. I was shaking so bad. <laughs> no, it was pretty funny. Okay. Uh no setup. Just gonna jump right in. Go for it. Time now for the tale of the ghost of my mother's ghost. I was eight years old when it first happened. I always saw her in the same place, roughly the same time of year. During the summer, here at my family's lake cabin, my great-grandpa and some of his friends built a cabin along the shore of Flathead Lake, not far from Kalispell or Big Fork, Montana, back in the 1950s. Doesn't look like much now compared to all the second-home mansions that have been built near it since the 1980s, but the land it sits on is truly breathtaking. It'd be worth a mint if we sold it today, and maybe we should. The cabin sits on over an acre of mostly flat land. Grass from the yard runs almost all the way down to the water. And my great-grandpa and his friends brought in tons of sand to take you down the rest of the way. Most has eroded away, but it's still got a bit more of a beach than most other properties in the area. July, August, early September are about the only times you ever really want to swim in the water. Too cold the rest of the year. There's a nice floating dock with a couple of slips. It's got electricity and plumbing, and my grandparents and parents have done a bit of remodeling over the years to update it a bit. There's sheetrock inside now, hardwood floors, so you're not too worried about bugs climbing all over while you sleep. There's still no AC, but you don't need it. It never really gets that hot here. does get cold, though. A wood stove, baseboard heaters, a few space heaters keep the place warm enough in the cooler months to stop the pipes from freezing. A nice deep roof keeps the snow, which can really come down during ski season, from ever crushing the place. I grew up in Missoula, and we'd spend a few weeks here every summer. My mom's a teacher and had summers off, and my dad would also take at least a week's vacation to head up here, and on the other weeks, he'd come up for the weekend. There were almost always cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents around because everyone used it. The adults got the bedrooms, and us kids slept out on blow-up mattresses or the sofa bed. And one night, when I was seven, my mom woke me up in the middle of the night to check on me. I woke up to her giving me a soft kiss on my forehead and gently stroking my hair. Hey, Mom, I croaked. Shh. Don't wake anyone else. Uh, don't wake anyone else up. She whispered, and then she added, "I couldn't sleep. Wanted to see how you were doing out here, sweet boy. Love you," I said, half awake. "Love you too, sweet boy." And then as she walked away, I rolled over and went back to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, I was a bit embarrassed. Some older cousins were sleeping out in the front room too, and I didn't want any of them to have seen my mom giving me a kiss and checking up on me. So after breakfast, when just the two of us were next to each other out in the yard for a moment before I went out with Grandpa and my cousins to fish, I told my mom, you don't have to check on me at night. 
I'm fine, sleeping out in the living room. My mom looked confused. What are you talking about, kiddo? She asked. Last night, I said, when you came out to check on me and you gave me a kiss. She laughed. I think you were dreaming, buddy. I didn't wake up until this morning after climbing into bed last night. And then before I could say anything else, my aunt, her sister, called her away. And she said, have fun with grandpa. Hope you catch all the fish. And she gave me a quick kiss on the head and walked off. I was left thinking that maybe I'd just been dreaming like she said and jumped into the boat with my cousins. I didn't notice anything like that happening again for several years. I think now that things probably did happen, I just didn't notice them. But the next definite something occurred when I was 12. That time it happened during the day. I was skipping some stones on the edge of the water. Only a few cousins were also here at the cabin that day, and they were all 15 or 16. I was only 12. They'd went wakeboarding, and I decided to stay at the cabin. It was an awkward age difference, and I remember feeling like the odd man out that summer and being super bummed about it. I'd gotten tired of them teasing me, and I was pouting a bit when she appeared. After tossing another small flat rock out across the water, my mom was suddenly behind me. Hey, sweet boy, how you doing? She startled me. Even though she sounded sweet, she still scared me because I did not see or hear her coming up, and I couldn't figure out how that could be. It's a good 30 or 40 yards between the water's edge and the cabin, and there's no trees in this part of the yard to be hidden behind. How could she have walked that whole distance and have uh, me not notice? Fine, I said, but not really meaning it. It's all right, kiddo. They're just in a different place with you right now with their age. You'll catch up soon enough. Want to come inside and play a game with me? Sure, I said. But then right after I said it, I heard a car coming down the driveway. I looked to see who it was, and it was my mom's Subaru Outback. Who's driving your car? I asked. And when I didn't hear a response, I twisted around to look at where my mom had just been standing, and now no one was there. She'd vanished. I spun around in circles in disbelief. It was impossible. Where the hell had she gone? What are you doing, weirdo? My mom now yelled at me from the car. Trying to make yourself dizzy? I must have went pale and looked shocked when she asked that, because now she stopped the car short of completely pulling up. Are you okay, River? You don't look well. I just stood and stared back, mouth agape, stunned silent. I didn't know what to say. Stay right there, she shouted. She pulled up the rest of the way, parked the car, got out, and jogged over to me. I had tears in my eyes and was still silent by the time she made it to me. She took my face in her hands and asked, what's going on with you? I started crying and she hugged me. After a few moments, I pulled myself together. Mom, you were just talking to me before you got here. You were here. What is going on? I'll never forget the way she looked at me when I said that. I think she knew something about what I'd seen. I think maybe she'd at least caught a glimpse of herself at the cabin before. Maybe she'd written it off as her mind playing tricks on her, but now I was saying that. I don't know, sweet boy, she said. I, I bet you're dehydrated. You never drink enough water when you're running around here. She took me inside, got me some water, made me some mac and cheese, and insisted I take a nap. I did. The whole encounter had exhausted me. We didn't talk about it after I woke up. I don't think either of us knew what to say. The rest of that summer, I don't think she ever left the cabin without me, though. And it didn't happen again. The next summer was the most intense. I think my mom and I were both be able to were both able to put the previous summer out of our minds after nothing weird happening the first whole week we were there. But then there was a day or two when we were there alone, just me and my mom. I'm an only child. My dad was working. One group of cousins had just left. My grandparents had to take care of something back in Helena where they lived, and the next family group wouldn't be there for another day or two. My mom had laid down for a nap, and I was on the front porch reading a book. Suddenly, again, I did not notice her approaching. My mom was walking up from a few feet away and then sitting down next to me. Hey, she said, let's play a game. Okay, what game? This. My mom then proceeded to set out a Ouija board on the floor, uh, on the porch, the front of the, or the floor of the porch in front of me. She said, I used to play this here when I was a kid. Ouija board? I'd never heard her talk about one. I'd never seen one in real life before. Despite what had happened the summer before, my guard was down and I didn't sense that anything was wrong at the time. I truly thought I was just gonna be playing a game with my real mom, so I sat down and we began. Oh shit. And soon, we contacted something. Then with my mom's encouragement, we invited it into this world to take its rightful place. The thing tricked me. I had no idea what was going on. My mom seemed so happy, elated, and then my actual mom came outside. What are you doing? She yelled, scaring the hell out of me. I was just, I stopped. No one was sitting next to me. How did you? I started to ask. I felt dizzy. It had happened again. Who was here? My mom, my real mom now asked. She was as pale as a ghost. Y you were. Oh God, she said. I did this. I really did let it in. And now it must want to stay. I've never ever seen either of my parents look as scared as my mom looked in that moment. She started crying. I don't know what to do. She said, how am I supposed to protect you from something that looks and sounds like me? 
She called my dad right after that, told him we were coming home. I could tell by her reactions that he was pissed. He probably thought my mom was cracking up and making me think the crazy stuff she was talking about was real. How can you convince someone who hasn't seen a doppelganger that it's real and that your word is going to hurt you or your child? It never did hurt me, or at least it hasn't yet, but it did hurt my parents' marriage. My mom forbid me to go to the cabin after that, which really upset my dad and really hurt her own parents' feelings. She later explained that she had once played with the Ouija board at the cabin when she was a kid, her and a cousin, and they'd invited some spirit to join them. It said it couldn't come into our world unless one of them was willing to make a sacrifice. They both thought the other was moving the planchette, that none of what they were doing was real, so they agreed. They also didn't think that one of them would have to be that sacrifice, but then my mom's cousin drowned a few <gasps> days later in the lake. She was a real strong swimmer, and it shook everyone up really bad. My mom felt guilty. She was certain that playing with that Ouija board had something to do with her cousin's death, and she never told anyone. And then, after that, only at the cabin, sometimes she was sure that she saw that cousin. Sometimes she also thought she saw herself. But then, she left home, went to college, stopped going to the cabin for a few years, and all of it seemed to fade away. She wondered if it was just her guilt had driven her a little bit mad. But now it was happening again. She was convinced that whatever she'd seen as a kid was now back, and she was also worried, even though I didn't agree to any kind of sacrifice, that I'd die if I went back to the lake. Well, I didn't die, or at least haven't yet. But a few summers later, my mom did. <gasps> cancer. It was awful. Breast cancer. She didn't catch it early enough, and after they found out she had it, she died about two years later. I hadn't been to the cabin for years by that point. But then a year or so after she passed, my dad wanted me to go back with him. Big family reunion. So a few weeks ago, I went, and now, here I am. The very first night, after everyone else was asleep, just last night as I post this, I woke up to my mom standing in my room, or at least to someone who looked and sounded exactly like my mom. It's me, sweet boy. Your real mom, she said. And I know that probably wasn't true, but damn it, I want it to be true. She walked over, sat on my bed, leaned over and kissed me on the head. I'll always be here for you, she said, gesturing at the cabin around her. Right here, you can visit me anytime. I started to tell her that I missed her terribly when my dad, who was sleeping in the same room in the other bed, stirred and asked me who I was talking to. She vanished before he saw her, and I told her I must have just been talking in my sleep, and I went back to bed. Before I closed my eyes, I looked in the mirror above the dresser, and I could see out into the faint light of the hallway. And there she was, standing there, smiling, watching me. And you know what? I was terrified, fucking terrified, but also, I didn't want her to leave. Was she the doppelganger? Or was she my real mother's ghost? I didn't know. I still don't know. I do know that I want her to be my mother. And that if I believe that and she looks and sounds, even smells and feels like my mom, what does it matter if it isn't true? It's getting dark as I write this. The sun set over an hour ago. Everyone else is almost asleep. I think I'm going to head out on the porch and just read a bit on my Kindle. Just wait. See who shows up. Maybe my mom will visit me again. Maybe she'll want to play a game. Maybe this time if we play, if she's not with me now, I can use the Ouija board to find her. Have her switch places with this thing. Maybe I can trick it. It's worth a shot, right? If it doesn't work, maybe I can join her. Right now, staying here at this cabin forever suddenly seems like a wonderful idea. Uh-oh. They're already starting to sound a little possessed. A little nuts. A little off the rocker. Okay, no picks with this story. But I did uh, find a pic of, uh, this is from The Haunting of Bly Manor. It's the, the Lady in the Lake. And for some reason, this picture just reminded me of this story. I'm nervous. Ooh. Just, okay. some, just some figure that looks kind of like a person that used to exist, but not really. The face isn't fully developed. What's which, worse, her or the person behind her? Oh, yeah. In this particular photo, mm, her. Well, I don't know. They're both, they're both bad. Know. They're both bad. Yeah. But that photo, because of the way that it's laid out, makes me think like, what if the bad ghost and his mom's ghost, what if they both showed up simultaneously? Then what's he supposed to do? That's weird. Yeah. Right. Like prove to me that you're my mom. Like, you know, prove to me which one of you is my real mom. How is mm -hmm. that going to go? How yeah. is that going to yeah, go? Like if a doppelganger showed up, like if a doppelganger, like we've talked about in these stories, you know, if someone alive and then that person dies and then that person's ghost somehow shows up and the doppelganger shows up. That's a real mind fuck. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, like, I think you'd have to do like a little like written test. Like, okay, here's mm -hmm. a piece of paper and a pen. Which one of you can answer this question correctly? And then you start asking things that only his, his actual mom could know. Yeah. I yeah. hope. I don't know. I don't Ugh. know what else to do. Right. 
oh no, he just doesn't sound well by the end. True. Which I understand it's like you lose your parents, you know, in a horrible way Mm -hmm. at a young age. You just want them back. You want your time back. You miss them. Grief makes people do really intense things. Yeah. So. Common theme with like, uh, you know, certain entities we've talked about here on the show, especially love the the demonic kind of spectrum. Mm -hmm. Uh, Very manipulative. Yeah. 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 And I was so sad about the cousin. Mm-hmm. Like, dang, Ouija board, and just a few days later, one of you dies. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. oh, boy. I was just thinking about like how strange that would be mm-hmm. to be me hanging out with you to then you show up. Oh, my God, yes. You would think I was nuts, too. Mm-hmm. If I was like, oh, wait no, a Doppelganger second. stories are the worst because it's, oh. it's just so confusing, so disorienting. Well, they, and they make you see, They make you seem so insane. Mm-hmm. Like there's, ah, <laughs> I am, yeah, okay. And I, I noted that um, the ghost mom, the 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 bad ghost mom, let's just yeah, say, yeah. she uses that language, sweet boy. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, that's uncomfortable. Aye, aye, aye. Uh, ready to leave a doppelganger tale and get into the sad and disturbing lore of a strange Texas ghost or beast? The goat man. Mm-hmm. Bring it on, bro. We head to just outside of Denton, Texas, and explore the lore of the Goat Man and Goat Man's Bridge. Quite a bit of historical setup before we dive into the paranormal lore here. I like history. Okay, good. Uh, it's in the now abandoned community of Alton. Uh, not the small Texas town in Hidalgo County of the same name, but instead a former short-lived community that once existed about seven miles south of Denton is a haunted bridge supposedly haunted by a monstrous creature. Goatman's Bridge was once known as Old Alton Bridge. It's a historic Iron Trust Bridge connecting Denton and the little town of Copper Canyon, Texas. Uh, the bridge was originally built in 1884 by the King Iron Bridge Manufacturing Company. It was used for years to transport horses, cars, and cattle across Hickory Creek at a popular location previously used for fording cattle across the water. Uh, the bridge got its name from the little community of Alton, which, as I mentioned, no longer exists. Between 1850 and 1856, Alton was the seat of Denton County. Denton County formed in 1846, and early American settlers chose a spot on Pecan Creek for their first county seat. It was named uh, Pinckneyville in honor of Texas Governor James Pinckney Henderson. Just two years later, water shortages forced the county seat to move. In June of 1848, Alton was selected as the new county seat. No public buildings would ever be constructed in Alton, though. Most of the county business was conducted at the home of W.C. Baines, farmer, long-term resident, and then the county seat would quickly move again due again to a lack of enough water. In November of 1850, a site five miles from Corinth uh, was selected on Hickory Creek, the new location, again called Alton. This time they applied for a post office. In a few years, this new Alton, now known as Old Alton, had a hotel and two stores. By 1856, it had a blacksmith, three stores, saloon, hotel, doctors, a school, and lawyers. The Hickory Creek Baptist Church, still open today, was established in 1855. But then in November of 1856, county residents voted again to move the county seat. Oh, my goodness. Now to Denton. Many Alton residents moved away to Denton as well. And then by May of 1859, the Alton Post Office, not even open for a decade, closed permanently. The only parts of Alton remaining today are the Baptist Church and the church's Alton Cemetery, with graves dating back to 1852. In 1884, an iron bridge was built over Hickory Creek on Copper Canyon Road, and that bridge would become known as the Old Alton Bridge on July 8, 1880, or 1988 the old Alton Bridge was added to the National Register of Historic Places. The bridge had operated in continuous use for over a century. And then in 2001, a new bridge was constructed nearby. For decades, drivers crossing the old bridge would honk to alert other drivers they were about to cross because it was a one-lane bridge. Now the old Alton Bridge still used, but only for foot traffic. It connects the Elm Fork and Pilot Knoll hiking and equestrian trails. Nature lovers, photographers, and also paranormal enthusiasts all flock to the bridge today for different reasons. Time now for the tale of Goatman's Bridge. The primary origin story of Goatman's Bridge for some is more horrifying than the creature itself. There are two other alternative origin stories I'll share in a few minutes. This first one is the most commonly accepted. This origin tale shares a truly dark and disturbing, all too plausible reason that Old Alton Bridge is now known as Goatman's Bridge. According to this legend, Goatman was once a simple goat farmer by the name of Oscar Washburn. He was known as an honest and dependable man. Local customers gave him the Goatman name. 
Oscar built a reputation for producing high-quality meat, milk, cheese, and hides. In the 1930s, Oscar moved his family to a bigger home just north of the old Alton Bridge. To increase his business, he posted a sign on the bridge saying, This way to Goatman. Oscar had a good relationship with most of the community, but not everyone. Some locals despised him. They hated him simply because he was black and they wanted him dead. Back when American racism was far more widespread, accepted, and aggressive than it is today, local KKK members couldn't stand the idea of a successful black businessman thriving in their community. So some members of the KKK who worked with the police uh, worked with other KKK members on the city council to quickly and quietly pass a law that made solicitation on the bridge illegal. Suddenly, Oscar's harmless sign was breaking the law. And then instead of arresting Oscar or taking him to court, they murdered him. In August 1938, a group of KKK members with hearts full of hate and minds missing brains crossed the bridge, drove their cars through the dark night without headlights, kidnapped Oscar, taking him from his home while his terrified wife and children helplessly watched. They hung a noose on the bridge, threw it over Oscar's neck, and then tossed the man over the side. But then, according to the Goatman legend, when they looked down into the water below, the noose was impossibly empty. The hateful lynch mob now went back to Oscar's house and murdered his family lighting the home on fire, not allowing anyone to make it outside. That is the terrible main origin story, but how much of that horror is truth, and how much is myth and legend? It could all be myth. Historians today question the truth of this legend because there are no historical records to confirm that Oscar ever existed. However, due to the hardcore discrimination and racism of the time and place, written records concerning African Americans were not always kept. Whether or not Oscar and the story of his unjustly death is real or not, the Goatman legend was born and has been around ever since. By the end of the 19th century, reports began to trickle in of sightings and encounters of a ghost or creature on the bridge, a half-man, half-goat beast, goat beast, who became known as Goatman. Some reports say that the Goatman has fiery red fur. Others say his fur is so black it's impossible to see without a strong source of light. And allegedly, if you cross the bridge at night without any lights, Goatman may meet you on the other side. What he'll do once he sees you varies from one supposed sighting to the next. Visitors have reported seeing numerous shadowy figures, strange floating lights appearing in the nearby woods. Some people have even reported being touched, grabbed, having rocks thrown at them, or even thrown themselves. Other people say that they've heard the sounds of horses' hooves stomping across the bridge, someone splashing in the creek, laughter, even a deep growling coming from the woods. Car doors have reportedly locked and unlocked on their own. Cars have occasionally and inexplicably broken down on or near the bridge. Since the bridge has been closed off to auto traffic, some thrill seekers have driven up to the bridge on Halloween night and honked their horns twice, hoping to see Goatman's eyes appear in the distance. Many say they have seen his eyes. Recent claims online state that if you stop and say the Goatman's name after walking across in the dark, he'll appear on the bridge directly before you. Goatman's appearance is apparently most often preceded by the smell of rotting flesh. Some of those who've claimed to have actually seen the creature have reported first spotting red eyes glowing from the darkness. Others have claimed to have seen a snarling goat-headed man-beast stomping in the wooded shadows at the edge of the bridge. The most terrifying encounter stories have reported the Goatman as carrying both goat and human heads in his hands. Some also say the Goatman wasn't the only paranormal entity created from that disgusting, deplorable tragedy. They say that the ghost of his wife may now also haunt the area, searching relentlessly for her murdered family. People have claimed to encounter a female spirit crying in the middle of the bridge, who vanishes when approached. Now for the first alternative origin Goatman story. According to this legend, many decades ago, satanic worshippers used the bridge for a ceremony, opened some type of portal for dark forces. These worshippers went to the bridge to call upon a hellish entity known as Goatman. Their ritual worked, and a demonic figure emerged from the portal. And ever since, Goatman has been hunting and killing those foolish enough to summon him. Finally, there's a third uh, origin story similar to the first. According to this version of events, on July 8, 1860, a series of mysterious fires broke out in Dallas, Denton, and other nearby towns and communities like Old Alton. Some believe the fires signaled the beginning of a rebellion of local enslaved people. Newspaper editor Charles R. Pryor printed these accusations, stated that some enslaved people had confessed, which was a lie. Widespread rumors now spread like wildfire that enslaved people and abolitionists were working together to poison, murder, and rape, and rape enslavers. Mobs gathered to hunt down and kill anyone suspected of starting the fires. According to this version of Goatman lore, one of these men was Jack Kendall, an enslaved goat herder. A group of men from Copper Canyon murdered Jack by hanging him from a tree near the old Alton Bridge. 
And when his body fell, Kendall's head allegedly completely separated from his body. And then the killers watched in disbelief as his dead, headless body rose up from the ground, ripping the head off a passing goat to replace his own. Like with Washburn, there are no records to confirm Jack Kendall actually existed. As with the Washburn lore, according to Jack Kendall lore, inviting the goat man to appear will, uh, while standing on the bridge will summon him before you. And a few online sources say that once summoned, the goat man might harm or even kill you, but only if you're descended from KKK members or enslavers. Sources differ on exactly when and how the goat man appears. Some say he lays dormant for many years and only awakens to hunt for victims. Others claim he sleeps during the day and hunts at night making it safe to cross the bridge during the day unless you say his name, which will call him back to the area. Over the decades, there have been numerous stories of abandoned cars found near the bridge with no signs of their owners. In the fall of 1967, the police allegedly responded to a series of reports of abandoned cars near the bridge. Some of the cars looked like they had been abandoned in a hurry. Proof of Goatman, perhaps? There have also been reports of disappearances in nearby towns, which has only added to the mystery. Popular paranormal show, probably the most popular, uh, I would say ever, Ghost Adventures investigated Goatman's Bridge in a Season 9 episode. Ghost Adventures cinematographer Jay Wasley and his former wife Ashley, photographer, said that they had such a traumatic experience at Goatman's Bridge that it affected their marriage. Goatman was Ashley's last episode with the team. Ashley Richardson was, quote, never the same after her investigation. During the investigation, Ashley felt overcome with anger, other strong emotions. She felt a strong urge to harm Zach Bagans. She went into the woods to face her fears, then she was attacked and hit hard enough on her head to leave a bruise. A lot of strange happenings occurred during the filming of that episode. Like within an established safe zone, the crew had a small fire going, and when Zack walked over to the bridge, the fire that had burnt down to embers suddenly roared back to life, crackling. Later, Aaron Godwin, or Goodwin, excuse me, a cameraman, was looking at a spot in the woods when he suddenly screamed in pain and flew through the air. Aaron claimed he was pushed and knocked over by an invisible force. He said he'd been thrown almost 20 feet. He told the crew, I'm looking in there and here, the woods, and something came at me and hit me. He described it as a massive force of energy that pushed him backwards from his chest. Aaron's flashlight was thrown into the bushes. His camera ended up being about 20 feet back, along with a mark in the dirt where he fell. The next crazy occurrence was when Zach Bagans allegedly was possessed by a spirit near the bridge and started to choke himself on camera. In one clip, Zach says, something's not right. We all feel fear. We're turning on each other. Ghost Adventures also captured a pair of what looked like glowing eyes in the same area where Aaron was pushed. The Ghost Adventures team isn't the only group of professional ghost hunters to have claimed to experience intense paranormal activity on or around the bridge. Becky Vickers, a paranormal tour guide, author of The Secrets of Goatman's Bridge, True Tales of Chilling Paranormal Encounters at One of the Most Haunted Bridges in America, frequently visits Goatman's Bridge and has claimed to have witnessed all kinds of paranormal activity. She also says she's found evidence of possible satanic activity on or near the bridge, like a ritual altar deep in the woods near the bridge. She said, The twigs are blackened as though they've been burned by fire. It also has black mesh-like ribbon woven in and out of it. Vicker says she's taken several pictures of tour guests who have claimed to have been scratched by invisible forces on the bridge. One young boy complained that his stomach was burning, and then his mom lifted up his shirt and revealed three fresh red scratches on his stomach. A 16-year-old girl felt uneasy during the entire tour. When they were walking back towards the bridge, she suddenly screamed, Something scratched me! She lifted up her shirt, and the group saw three scratches on her side. Both of those incidents occurred on different nights at different times. One man told Becky he saw a goat man. Late one night, he, his girlfriend, and another couple went to the bridge. It was 1 a.m. The guys thought it'd be funny to scare the girls, so they drove out to the middle of the bridge, turned off the car. The girls wanted to leave. He and another boyfriend insisted on staying. They waited 15 minutes. Nothing happened. They started to relax, talking, drinking beer, when the bridge suddenly started to shake, like something big was walking on it. Pounding footsteps approached them. They heard the sound of hooves on the bridge. They couldn't see anything, though, because it was pitch black. Then when they turned on their headlights, they claimed to see the half-man, half-goat entity on the bridge in front of them. And then, when his car wouldn't start for several tries, they thought they were going to die. Eventually, luckily, it did start. They reversed so fast, they almost drove off the side of the bridge and into the ravine. Finally, one week after spending a lot of time at the bridge, Becky Vickers started noticing items missing around her house. And then they'd reappear in strange places. For example, she was reading one night and she got up to use the bathroom, put her glasses inside her book, just like she always does. When she came back, the glasses were gone. The book was closed, searched all over the house for them, but she couldn't find them. Then when she went to the kitchen to get some water, they were there on the kitchen floor. Did she maybe just misplace them? She swears she didn't, and when she went to look for them after they disappeared, she says the lights in the house began to flicker on and off. 
Following finding them, the TV turned on and off at exactly 3 a.m. for a week straight, going from a program to nothing but static. Items that didn't have batteries started to turn on by themselves. After all that, she called out for an electrician who found nothing wrong with her house. Becky stood in her living room floor after yet another sleepless night, told the spirits it was her house and she wasn't going anywhere. She said they could live together as long as they didn't hurt her or her daughter. And then after that, she says, strange events in her home never happened again. But the paranormal activity occurred at Goatman's Bridge, uh, can, you know, continued to occur after that. There are still more examples than the ones I've shared. Other claims of strange things happening to those who visit the bridge after they've left it. According to uh, one online commenter, whether truly haunted or not, there is something very eerie, some strange energy that surrounds Goatman's Bridge. They wrote that standing on the bridge in the middle of the night, surrounded by darkness, it's easy to understand the fear that those who reportedly have seen the goat man have felt. Many truly believe that the bridge is very haunted and that the goat man of the old legends is very real. And they say if you don't believe in these legends and are willing to tempt fate by trying to lure him out, you will absolutely regret it. No thanks. Would you go out there? You know what? I say that sitting here now, but honestly, like I've <laughs> seen the pictures and like the Google kind of like satellite views of the area and it's pretty remote. And just being out in the middle of an old bridge at, at night, if it was like a really dark night, mm -hmm. that would for sure creep me out. I, I, I don't know. I think my bravery would fade pretty quickly, <laughs> especially if I was supposed to do it alone. Well, I don't know that I could do it alone. Like, I could do it with a group of other people. Like a pretty large alone. group. Yeah, I'd want at least two other people. Oh, that's not even a group. I'm talking like 15, 20. <laughs> Yeah, that was like a small collection. I need more than that. Yeah. I'd want like a, a two other, ideally two other guys, bigger guys. Um, Just to feel uh, safe. And at least one of them armed. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I want to be prepared. So you, Logan, and Tyler go to a bridge. Yeah. Uh, I, have a, I have a few pictures. Uh, this first, a pic of Goatman's Bridge, just kind of during the day, just from a little distance. Right, so during the day, just yeah, it's fine. Old bridge. Whatever. Uh, next one, uh, another pick of the bridge during the day, just kind of looking down at what you'd see if you were crossing it, um, like if you were uh, approaching it. So okay. again, yeah. you know, it's picturesque. It's on the Register of Historic Places. Yep, I bet people go there to take wedding photos. Yeah, yeah. Like, has that kind of vibe. Uh, at night, obviously, uh, gets a little, little spookier. Yep. <laughs> and I'm out. <laughs> And then uh, one more picture of the bridge at night. Not sure what's going on with all these lights in this photo, but just oh, eerie photo. I thought it was going to be something worse. I don't know what I... Um, well, the way that they're placed, it almost seems like... like lanterns or something? Yeah, like lampposts or like something. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it got to a point where uh, people were sneaking out there and getting hurt. Like just mm. trying to go on little ghost hunts where maybe the city was like, all right, well, let's light it up. It's cool looking. Eerie but cool looking. And then, mm -hmm. uh, or I guess it could just be staged for the photo too. That's true. Yeah. And then this next photo is uh, someone imagining what the uh, goat man guy would look like. Like that kind of entity. Ooh, oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. No thanks. Ooh. Does that one really bother you? Yeah. Why? Look it, at him. Because He's looking the, at you. The body's too real. Like the body's very, very real. Yeah. You know, it just has that like really uncomfortable. Uh, no, thank you. What if you uh, were letting the dogs out at night? Stop. And you like looked out. And Stop! <laughs> oh my god, I don't like it. And then, <laughs> oh my gosh. And then the last. I know I don't want to say any more because I don't want to make things worse myself. Exactly. And then uh, this last one is. Uh, this is a real sighting of Goatman. Uh, definitely, this is Saturday Night Live. This is <laughs> definitely. <laughs> it did remind me. I forgot about the old Jim Brewer character. Oh. <laughs> and he'd do all those weird songs while while making his goat sounds. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was Jim Brewer's like biggest claim to fame actually was Goatman. I think that was his main character. Oh god. And, and I will say it would also be super like it would be super creepy to see that last creature by the bridge at night. Maybe equally creepy to see Jim Brewer in costume <laughs> by that bridge at night. Like it, like if he didn't know you were coming and you just like with a few friends and you look at it, you're like is that is that Jim Brewer? That would be great. Dressed up like Goatman? I thought you were going to say it would be creepy to see Goatman in your backyard. Equally as creepy to see Jim Brewer in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I mean, yeah. Still creepy. Very out of context. Like, why yeah. is Jim Brewer in my backyard? Uh, why does Jim Brewer know where I live? Especially pose like that Goatman photo. My gosh. So silly. Uh, now I want to go. I wonder if our kids know that character. Probably not. Uh, they, probably they only not. know like. They don't know vintage SNL. Oh, vintage SNL. That's I, a nice way to say that. I think it does fall into the vintage. I think it's been enough years now. I, think, I mean, it's not like Chevy Chase, you know, Jim Belushi, vintage SNL. Yeah. Um, Ten, it's pretty old now. 10 years is vintage, I think. Is that what it is? I think so. I think the Jim Goatman's got to be at least 20 years. Yeah. Oh, 20, oh, at least 25 years, probably. Okay. 
Well, I guess we're vintage. Yeah. Everything's vintage. We're cool. Vintage is cool. Yeah, vintage is, is in. It's always in, actually. <laughs> uh, Glitch in the Matrix. Okay. This is such a fascinating story. It It is just, a, it's like a real head scratcher is what I would call it. All right. It didn't, it didn't scare me in the like, oh my God, I'm so freaked out way. It just made me feel like, huh, what happened there? Mm -hmm. Have you ever had like glitchy matrixy kind of things happen in your life? Yeah, I've had like weird feelings. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like where all, all of a sudden, like I like you go into a room, I mean, just like deja vu type feelings. Yes, me or, too. Or or feelings, and we talked about this a little bit this weekend, um, of like feeling like you were transported into a different place you've been by going into a room. I have that feeling sometimes where it's like suddenly a room will feel like, I'm like, this doesn't feel like where we're at. It feels like but some other city. Is that when you're sober? Yes, but like, or is that only a feeling you get when you're on shrooms? It's it's when I've recently, maybe recent. Well, now I just don't know because like sometimes that stuff gets in you, and like sometimes I'm like, well, is that a sh like a shroom after effect or some other psychedelic after effect? Is what's talking to my brain right now? But, so I, wait, think, but, still, I, but I had those feelings before I did any of that stuff. You too. did? Mm -hmm, just like like huh. uh, yeah, I, I guess yeah, just like a deja vu type feeling, and I, that's what I would equate to like a glitch in the matrix type feeling. Okay, okay, I forget like the actual reason why we have deja vu, but I feel like I've. I've looked into it too, and there are theories. Yeah. But I can't remember them right now. Either. I know. Not not successfully prepared to answer that. But I get deja vu feelings mostly around people, not mm -hmm. so much places. They're occasionally, but with yeah. a place, but mostly with people where I'm like, I it, it'll be weird where it's like, I know this story. Or like mm. and it'll be someone new-ish, like maybe someone I've only met once or twice before. So not a very close yeah. friend, a peripheral friend, an acquaintance of somebody else's, where I'm like, I know you. I know this yeah. story. What's happening? And it is, it kind of freaks me out. Be, it, it's twofold. It freaks me out because what the heck is happening? Right. But then also it stresses me out because I'm like, oh boy, are they about to tell me, like ask me something about a story they already told me and I should remember? Like I feel yeah. like a, a bad friend, whatever. Yeah. Like, oh. I should, I should share. Uh, this is a uh, not good role model story for the kids out there. But uh, I did look into this before. And I don't think there's any harmful effects as far as, you know, once you've been in someone experienced with psychedelics. But, but uh, you know, recently, as you know, uh, I, during the peak of a pretty heavy dose of oh, shrooms. Yeah. What do they call that? A hero dose? Almost. I did. Yeah. It was like uh, for any like shroom, lover, four grams, about four grams of shrooms. And then um, on top of that, so at the top of the peak of the way it works, like when you're hallucinating the hardest, I then also uh, smoked DMT for a while. Oh, yeah. That did not go well. And it did not <laughs> go well. There it will be no well. stacking. Time froze. And then for the next 10 minutes, because it's a shorter cycle, I, and obviously the kids were not around us for this. Kids were their moms. So it's, uh, we had the house to ourselves. <laughs> we we're, were at, at home where it's pretty safe. But I, out, out the front door, we have like, uh, there's some glass in there and parts where you can see through it. And so I was able to see, you know, through a portion of the front door. And there was, it looked so clearly, not like a shadow, two demonic faces that were like moving in their facial features and were dead and their eyes were watching me and I couldn't get them to stop looking at me. I was afraid to move out of the chair. And then on our portrait TV, we have this Yosemite picture with a oh, reflective yeah. pool kind of in front of the mountain. That reflective pool became a portal to hell and I could see demons and things like walking around inside there. And I, I was like, don't freak out. Don't freak out. Don't scare Lindsay. Don't, don't, she, she's having a fun time. Don't ruin it. Just keep it in your head. Keep it in your head. And then after about 10 minutes, it went away. But it was not a fun 10 minutes. In that 10 minutes, I put my head down and was eyes closed, not sleeping. I was on a different shroom planet where also dangerous <laughs> things were happening. Remember? Because when I, yeah. I was like, oh, I was not in a good place. Weird. So Weird you, energy. You brought the bad energy. Some, I brought some bad juju into the What is the, the DMT? House. I know. Yikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yikes. We should probably cleanse the house, actually, because maybe you were tapping into something. Oh, man, I hope not. It was terrifying. <laughs> and, then it, and then it was fine again. And then it was fine again. Then I'm everything like, was great. Just that like 10 minutes. I'm like, why did I go to hell for 10 minutes? Well, hmm. did it to yourself. <laughs> All right. Well, let's check out uh, this anonymous sender's bizarre story. Okay. Hey, Lindsay. Hey, Dan. I was hesitant to share my story with you as I'm still working through the back catalog and I wasn't sure my unexplained tale would fit. But after the man from Turin's story, mm. I knew I had to share. I must preface this that I'm an atheist and a skeptic and I still cannot explain what happened. 
Part of it I can comfortably speculate on, but some of it is just too weird. And so without further ado, I grew up in a town that was only 45 minutes to an hour's drive to the Oregon coast, specifically Lincoln City and Depot Bay via Highway 22 Pass. My mother and I regularly took Saturday trips to the beach to have lunch, play in the sand, and escape the turmoil at home. One Saturday, when I was nine, we went over for a typical Saturday escape. As our day wore on, the sky darkened and a sudden big storm rolled in. My mom did not really feel comfortable trying to get us back over the pass to get home. And if you're familiar with the Oregon mountain passes, and especially our coastal passes, I'm sure you will sympathize with her. She decided she would, we would just hunker down in Lincoln City for the night and weather the storm. The problem was that most everyone else had the same idea. Almost everything had no vacancy, and those that did have vacancy didn't accept pets, and our dog Duchess, Duchess was with us. As we frantically searched for a hotel, we noticed a penny saver motel with the vacancy sign on and a pet's welcome sign. I can still see this little motel clearly in my mind 27 years later. It was a small motel with a short, single-story row of rooms, small parking lot with an office, and small indoor swimming pool on the other side. It was only about $45 a night, which was a huge relief to my mom, who was recently single. She went in and secured us a room. The room we were given was so small that when you opened the door, it almost hit the bed, but it was safe for the night. We got our stuff in, and as it was still only the late afternoon, my mom decided we could make it just up the road to the movie theater, and we went to see The Big Green. We left Duchess in the room, as it would only be for the length of the movie. When we came back, we found that she had peed on the floor. My mom was clearly worried, as this would mean a cleaning fee, but decided to just clean it up and that we would notify management in the morning. Then, as we had brought my swimsuit for the beach, we ran across the parking lot in the pouring rain to go swimming. The pool stayed open late, and I spent over an hour running back and forth from the hot tub to the pool and back again. It was one of the best nights we ever had. We slept well that night and in the morning got ready and went to the office where my mother told the owner that our dog had had an accident. The woman was so sweet, so understanding. I remember so vividly she said, oh, don't worry about that, honey. I'm just glad we could be here when you needed us. It didn't seem strange to me at the time. My mom paid her with a credit card, gathered her receipt, and we left. The next weekend, we planned an overnight trip and my mom said we should just stay at the Penny Saver again since they were so reasonable, had a pool, and they were so nice. I was stoked. I loved going places with the swimming pool. When we pulled into <laughs> Lincoln City and we went to go to the Penny Saver, we were baffled. Exactly where it had been one week before, there was a parking lot with weathered and sun-bleached asphalt. My mom thought she must have forgotten exactly where it was, and we pulled into a restaurant for lunch to ask a local. We were advised that there had never, ever been a Penny Saver Hotel in Lincoln City, and to this day, there still is not one. We know we stayed in Lincoln City because it only took five minutes to get to the movie theater, and it is the only theater of that size, the only theater with more than one screen, within a 30 to 45 minute drive, and there is not another town from Lincoln City within a 15 minute drive. When we got home, my mom went and got the receipt from the previous weekend. And there it was, the Penny Saver Motel what? in Lincoln City, Oregon, with an address that led to that blank parking lot. We even had the ticket stubs from seeing the big green at the theater that night. To this day, we have no idea where we stayed. I sometimes speculate that it may have something to do with the multiverse. But then why did the woman say... I'm just glad we could be here when you needed us. The what? Wo the woman had had the kindest eyes and what seemed to be a knowing expression. My mom actually kept that receipt for 10 years. She would occasionally ask locals about it on her trips over the years, and every person always looked at us as though we had two heads. My husband still looks at me like I'm crazy, but the fact that my mom corroborated this story and has told it since it told it as this and has told it since as it happened over two decades ago does give him pause. I still wondered where I stay that night and where the kind lady and her motel went so that they could be there when we needed them. Take care, Anonymous. Man, that story gave me the chills. Isn't that weird? That would, I would get so anally fixated mm -hmm. on, on like, no, I have to know why. That would drive me fucking insane. I don't think I'd be uh, built psychologically for an experience like that. Interesting. I don't think I could let it go. Uh, I mean, maybe I could. I mean, I, you don't know what you can acclimate to, but man, that would mess with my mind so badly. Well, it's certainly something that would come up over and over again. 
Oh, yeah. Like, I would be daydreaming constantly. I, I would have, like, trouble focusing for a long time because my mind would wander to, like, what happened? Uh-huh. I, I would be going to that town and, like, asking more people, are you sure? I mean, you know, I'd be showing people the receipt. I, I the, the receipt part is the craziest part of that story to me. With, Actually having the receipt. With the address. Yeah, with the address. And be like, how, where is this? Where did this come from? I would want to like talk to the bank. Or I mean, I, I guess if you don't. City Hall? City Hall. But I, feel I was like, to the bank, but, I, but she didn't say that they used um, a credit card. I think about how we can track credit card purchases. But even oh. then, it would just show like, <sighs> it doesn't sound like the, back when this happened, that was uh, a thing. Yeah, it was 27 years <sighs> ago, she said, right? Yeah, so you wouldn't have that ability to trace. Right, 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 right. It wouldn't be linked to like some terminal <sighs> And the two of them together having this experience, uh huh. You, you know, like if it just happened to me, I think it would be easier to eventually write off because I'm like, well, maybe some other business by a different name, I don't know, some kind of like the receipts messed up and it happened to- I, I would Maybe be, it had the name of the old place. But, right. But I'd, the, I'd be looking for something. The fact that they've asked people who live there, <sighs> right. that like they're like, there's never been a penny saver. If they would have looked back at the hotel receipt and it just would have said motel, like no specifics. Yeah. Then I would be like, okay, you clearly got turned around. But the fact that it says Penny Saver Motel, yeah. and when they ask people in that town, they say it never existed, and there's still not one there today, like all these years later. It's not, they've been going there for so long. You would have found it by now. Yeah. Or some trace of it, or somebody else would have said, definitely. Oh, man, that, yeah, that's a mind bender. It really is. Well, yeah, now I totally get the glitch in the Matrix reference. Like, yeah, what happened? I mean, that that is the thing where it's like, I, I can't think about it too long. The whole, the whole Matrix theory that we are just, you know, it's probably been a while since I've mentioned it here. But in a nutshell, the theory is that we are in the uh, beginning of the, the, well, I guess kind of the middle of the transhumanist phase where there's humanism, where all humans are just human. You don't have any synthetic parts. And then as med medical tech advances, you know, there are synthetic limbs that, that have now become robotic. And that would be, I mean, a, a type of cyborg is, is what it really is, where you now are like transhuman. Mm -hmm. And that's going to keep advancing. So people will have synthetic hearts at some point. They'll have all these like um, uh, robotic body parts mm -hmm. and organs and things. They're working on those type of things now, 3D printing and stuff and all that stuff. Then post-humanism, in theory, is this thing we get to this place where we can live completely inorganically, where human consciousness can stay essentially in a hard drive. And the theory with this matrix type stuff is you get way out in the future. There's no more actual humans. There's these computers. It's never been explained to me why the computers would want to do these, do this, but they run these simulations uh, about like what humanity would look like, doing different types of like development, maybe coming up with like new kind of, I don't know, products for themselves, advancing themselves. And that we basically, like, they're so powerful, they could create, like, a, oh, like Red Dead Redemption, these games, Sims, these games we have now, something light years beyond that, where the characters are so real, they are real, they think they're real, and we're those characters. And we are living in just a super advanced simulation, and we are no more real than a video game character. I don't care, though. Like, because what does it matter? Because if you don't know the difference, what does it matter? What if we are just in a video game? Like what? If, I don't know. It matters to me. I don't like it. I, I mean, yes. If I, I don't want to be a video game character, it makes me, think I'm, makes me feel crazy. This no. is the kind of shit I think about on Shroom, Shrooms, and it starts to bend my trip in a bad way. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Like, without spending too much time uh, thinking yeah. about it, mm -hmm. if, if I just take it at surface level, yeah, I see what you're saying. What does it matter? Because it, because ignorance is bliss in, in a very topical way. But yes, as you dig deeper, it, it's like, oh God, that. That I could feel like be. Pinocchio, but I'm a real boy. Like I want to be real. <laughs> I want to be a real boy. Uh, it could be entirely true that we're just you mm -hmm. know lab rats and some experiment for people or things that are far more advanced than us. Ugh. No thanks. The one thing that I do love about this story mm -hmm. is that it's obvious that the house the the um, domestic situation is not good mm -hmm. and the mom is taking the daughter mm -hmm. away every weekend for a reprieve and then she eventually leaves her partner mm -hmm. and i appreciate so much that okay let's just say this was a glitch in the matrix some other like safe some other person who had gone through some terrible thing or whatever like they just like made this hotel pop up to give this mom respite from all the shit, it, the, just the way they say, like, we're yeah. just glad we could be here when you needed us. It doesn't sound creepy to me at all. It sounds heartwarming and, I don't know, empathetic. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of loved that. I do, I do like that part of it. Yeah. 
You're going to be in your head. I know. Yeah, I'll I'll work to get out of this next story. Okay. All right. Well, I have a great Appalachian Trail hunting story, I think. And I love telling this story this time of year because it's like people are rolling into hunting season. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think, oh, it's so, so weird to me. Are you going to be okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. (laughs) <sighs> long time space lizard time sucker here love the new podcast it's been great so far so okay so we're four years in yeah, yeah. And we're just getting to this so it's just like a good note like guys we just get so many stories and they get filed into different like categories yeah. and so don't stop sending them and if you, you just because you send it doesn't mean your show your episode ends up on a show but like just because you haven't heard it doesn't mean you won't hear it right might take a couple of years <laughs> clearly I've always been a huge horror fan and you guys have been killing it Oh, I've, thank you. I've ha- and I emailed with this person. They're still listening. Oh, great. You okay over there? Mm-hmm. What are you doing to Layla? I don't know. Okay. Just taking on some stress. <laughs> How uh, real boy. <laughs> <laughs> I've had my share of weird things happen to me throughout the years, but I have one in particular that I felt was noteworthy that may interest you. I'd have to say I lean more towards Dan's view of skepticism with the acceptance that there are things we don't know or understand. However, that being said, I can't deny what happened to me all those years ago, and it's been stuck with me to this day. I can't explain it or wrap my head around what actually happened. My dad is an outdoor enthusiast, to say the least. We grew up hunting, fishing, spending every waking moment in the woods or on the water when I was young. The woods have never frightened me or made me feel uneasy until this one day. I was about 16 at the time, and every year, my old man and me and some of his buddies would go to a camp they set up in the Appalachian Mountains near Lexington, Virginia. They would set up a big army-style tent with cots in it, a wood stove, a little kitchen area, and a few other amenities. It actually wasn't too shabby as far as camping in the woods for five days goes. In addition to me and my dad and his few buddies, there was an older gentleman that would come up with us who was a version of an old mountain man slash hermit. He was soft-spoken, but hard, like you could tell he had come from harder times, and he only spoke when he had something of value to say. The first day we're there this particular year, it goes off without a hitch. We're hunting in public forest lands on top of this one particular mountain range. My dad makes note to me that the Appalachian Trail runs up one side of the mountain, Being 16, I think I only half listened to him while he droned on about where and how to cut through the mountain. The rest of the week is pretty uneventful, but we weren't seeing many deer. My dad decided to change up his strategy a little bit and decided that the second to last evening of our trip, we would try out a new location. At about noon the the next day, we set out. After just a short drive in the truck, we got to a new spot, got out, and went in on foot, just me and dad. We hiked in a good mile back into the woods, and on the way, we passed along a long-since abandoned cabin that was in ruins. I asked my dad about it, and he said he didn't know much about it other than it was just old. I'm not sure why, but something about it felt off to me. We get to a point not far from there, and my dad looks at me and goes, This should be a good spot for you. I'd set up in that tree here, and and I'll go about 30 feet. Uh, and go up about 30 feet. We were using climbing tree stands. So up I go while he goes off on his hike and tells me he'll be about a half a mile away down over the next ridge. Most of the day went by pretty uneventfully, but I had noticed something strange shortly after I got settled into the tree. It was eerily quiet. None of the typical forest noises. No squirrels running or chattering. No birds chirping. Just this really surreal quiet. From my vantage point, I was on one side of a ridge. To my left, I could look up the hill for a good 200 yards before everything turned to brush, and to my right, I could look down the ridge about half that distance before encountering the same. About an hour before dark, I heard this crack of a limb above me, and I turned, not quite seeing what I expected to see. Instead of a deer, it was a woman. Now, something in my brain told me not to panic. My logic went something like, oh, a hiker, it's the Appalachian Trail. But instantly, I recognized something was off with her. She wasn't hiking along or moving, she was just standing there. And she appeared to be staring at me, or at least in my direction. She was a good 100 yards away, so I couldn't exactly tell. I don't know how she could see me, because the part of the tree I was in was well covered and I was in full camo. A super uneasy feeling set in as I noticed another detail. This woman was wearing a black dress, almost like you'd wear to a funeral. And at this point, I'm almost certain she's now staring directly at me. I still try to rationalize the hiker narrative in my mind, but I'm spooked, to say the least. 
I decide to look away and see if she moves. So I turn my head slowly, took my eyes off her. I let a few seconds pass, and then I glanced back, and just as quickly as she appeared, she was gone. Chills were rolling down my spine at this point as I continued to look for her. Maybe two minutes have gone by since she seemingly vanished when I heard a crack about 50 yards to my right. I slowly turned my head towards the source of the sound, praying to God it was a deer. It wasn't. It was her. And this time, she's only half the distance away as before and most certainly staring directly at me. For some reason, I couldn't make out her facial features even though I knew they were there. Something felt completely off with her face. My heart was beating out of my chest now. I decided the best thing to do was to ignore her. I once again look away for what felt like an eternity but was probably 30 seconds, and when I looked back, she was gone. Not a single trace. I think I sat, I, th I sat and thought about it and realized there was no way she could have closed the distance in that amount of time without making a sound. I kept trying to sell myself on the hiker narrative. My hands had a death grip on my rifle, and to say the least, I was shooken up. I, fum I fumbled around and found my two-way radio and keyed it to talk to my dad. Uh, hey man, <laughs> it's uh, getting dark. You ready to start hiking back? I said. He keyed back. Yep, I'm getting ready to walk out. Go ahead and start coming down out of the stand now, and I'll see you when I get there. As I'm sure Lindsay would say, nope. <laughs> I stayed in the stand until I could see my dad walking towards me, to which he yelled at me and told me to get my ass in gear and get down there. I didn't dare mention any of this to him because in all my life, my dad had never been one to believe a ghost story. We hiked out, and as we walked by that cabin, I got cold, full body chills. It was dark by the time we got back to the truck. Obviously weird enough at this point, right? Well, it gets worse. Remember that old timer? We were sitting around camp that night and my dad's making some food and everyone's having a few beers since it's the last night there and we were heading out in the morning. I remember looking at my dad and going, hey, so where were we tonight? That's, that's where the Appalachian Trail runs, right? And he replied, no, that's where we were yesterday, complete opposite side of, opposite side of the mountain. Why? I muttered no reason and walked back to my cot and sat down. I looked up and the old timer is staring at me with a little grin on his face. We make, we make eye contact and he goes, you saw her, didn't you? I couldn't even come up with a response as bad as I wanted to ask him more questions. I was just too embarrassed to admit I'd seen something for fear of the ridicule I knew would come from a bunch of 40 year old half drunk men in a tent. So I kept that shit to myself. This crazy old kook validated what I thought I had seen and I was even more worked up now. I didn't sleep a single wink that night. The next morning, we broke down camp and headed out. Me and my dad were the last out, and on the way down the mountain, his truck split an axle and put us off, uh, off, and puts us off the side of a ravine. This turns into a two-day ordeal and a chain of events that got us to a mechanic in Lexington who was able to fix it up and get us back on our way. Probably unrelated, but I can't help but wonder if that woman had something to do with it. To this day, I've never told my dad about what happened. I'm not sure he'd believe me if I did. And I never saw the old man again. The following year, I was of legal driving age and was too busy doing dumb shit in cars and getting myself into trouble to go hunting with my dad on a creepy fucking ghost mountain. <laughs> I did ask my dad, though, one time if the old man was still alive, but I guess he had passed on years ago, so I'll never get any more answers. Hope you guys continue to do great work with this podcast, and it continues for a long time. I look forward to it just as much as time suck and the secrets suck every week now. Can't get enough. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for everything you do. Keep on sucking, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. The Lady of the Woods. I know. I like that story. Yeah, me too. It's like a classic kind of like ghost sighting. Yeah. And I just love that old man. You, mm -hmm. saw, you saw her too? Because without that, the story, it's not that it's not good. It's just not as good. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. really puts a button on it. That's such a common part of paranormal lore with the ghosts is like the Lady of the Lake, Lady of the Woods. Mm. So fascinating to me. Like the these uh, so many sightings from around the world, different cultures, different times, of just a lone woman. I know what is that about? It's no idea. Not a lone man. I know it's it's usually in those. I mean, there are like you know plenty of like male ghost sightings, but more often, more often like women. It seems like. And and, yeah. and especially like that lone thing. I feel like a lot of times if it's a, a male ghost sighting, it's a shadowy dude inside the room, inside the cabin. Creepy or, guy. Creepy guy. Or like, you know, uh, maybe somebody wearing like soldier's garb, you know, mm. like, on a Civil War battlefield. Like they're like, they're lost. Yeah. And, and then, but there's like these, uh, yeah, these women sightings. And a lot of times it's like a younger, attractive mother type for yeah. figure. I wonder where that does come from. Well... I have to wonder if, uh, okay, just like 
feeding into stereotypes. Mm -hmm. But is it like the mom who is, has come back to try and find her children because she died and her kids didn't die or the kids yeah. died too? Like she's coming back with the purpose of finding her family, of taking care, of making sure everyone's okay. Just that like natural maternal instinct to care and protect for a family in the way a mom does. And, you know, women just stereotypically more gentle. So it's like, because mm. what I find interesting about the sightings of like the woman of the lake, whatever, while you're scared that you saw her, she's generally not aggressive. She's generally not scary. Yeah, sometimes. Sometimes but, but, she's rotted away. but Yeah, and a part of some like curse type thing, but, yeah, but oftentimes not, not most, aggressive. Yeah, like I would say like 80% of the time, she's a soft, warm, you know, yeah. loving kind of spirit. You're scared because you're like, what the fuck did I just see? Mm -hmm. But she herself is not scary. Whereas male entities, we got like the hat man, like the burnt True. paper dude. We got, you know, cryptid people. It's like those are predominantly more, well, the hat man is male yeah. by our standards. Um, cryptids, I guess, are I I genderless, like, but like they they just feel like more like angry male energy. I feel I feel like um, uh, some psychologists would say like this is our projecting our, our views of men and women like out into like the paranormal now. I, I would probably agree with that. Just like you do with like religion where it's like, you know, uh, male God figures tend to be angry, mm -hmm. vengeful. Female God, figure, Mother Nature, you know, tend to be She's more nurturing, comforting, yeah. you yeah. know, uh, like uh, our our want to return almost to the womb kind of like feelings with that. Yeah. As opposed to like these righteous gods of vengeance, you know, that are like male warrior type gods. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, because there is or, a psychology to it all. Or or not, or we're overanalyzing or the whole the, thing. Right, or those creatures have influenced us. It's like the chicken and the egg. <sighs> Especially did, if we're in the Matrix. Did they make us? Did the did the angry males and the nurturing females oh, man. create us or did we create them? What if, what if that's like in an alternate level of the Matrix layer, plane? Uh, the the ghosts are like who who birth us. The things that we are yeah. afraid of on this in this area of uh, of life. Yeah. On another plane. Maybe we're seeing celestial beings. Oh my gosh. Now I'm in Westworld. We have to get to the center of the maze. Oh my gosh. Do we ever get there? <laughs> That's humanity's quest. Why are we here? <sighs> what does all this mean? Well, you don't want to get me started on it because you know I think it's all nonsense. <laughs> something. It's something. Is it? Yep. Why? Why? Life. Life is something. We'll just think about just on the science end about like this bang of this explosion of atomic particles that then sure. creates all, that itself is magical. That that is magical. But then trace it back before the explosion. Well, what existed then? Not nothing. Something cannot come from nothing. You know, uh, something at the very least whew, breathed life into all this. The, the great mystery. And let it be that. True. Most time I can. Sometimes I really want to know. <laughs> I know, I know. It's just one of those things where it's like I can't get, I'll, I'll get so hung up on it that it'll mm -hmm. keep me up, you know, and it's just not, I know I'm not going to find that answer. So I know so many people have tried. Yep. Or maybe somebody did. Marshall Applewhite, Heaven's Gate cult leader. Exactly. He was He was the one. Bingo, got it. Genius. Adidas tracksuits or Nike, <laughs> Nike tracksuits, whatever they were. The track Nike, suits. Nike shoes, tracksuits, quarters. Catch the, uh, I don't know, ghost space bus behind oh the comet, whatever it was. Oh, boy. You've been studying too many cults. Do you want to do some uh, Annabelle shout outs? I do. I have been studying too many cults because I threw that out there. and I'm like, well, actually, it was a space Jesus space shuttle <laughs> that he was behind the Haley Bob <laughs> I hear, comet. I, like, I hear the guys laughing. The, uh, oh, man. Oh, okay. boy. You got to get your facts straight. <laughs> Uh, you said you want me to start with the Annabelles? Oh, you can. Sure. Oh, okay. I'll start with the, uh, with uh, uh, Megan Gilbert. I believe it's Megan, not Megan, because the A in there. Uh, Rebecca Turner. <laughs> uh, this is great. Lord Excandescentia of Matthias Palace. Lovely. Toddy, Germany. Rob Paskovich. Joseph Roberts Piner. Same Prime. Joshua Pomeroy. Same Prime, Sam. You added an E there. I did it again. Maybe it's Sam Prime, or it's the same Prime. <laughs> Jennifer, That's like, what was it last time? Brain power? Right. <laughs> Jennifer Serrano. Uh, Chong, oh, man. Changel Falgett. Chantel? Uh, are you just throwing letters? No. This is C-H-A-N-G-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. Was it supposed to be a T? No, I think that's right. Okay. So. Chongel. Chongel. Uh, totally Dubby. Sl slum buns. I totally... Did I put a... Did I put a spelling, a phonetic thing? Mm -hmm, you did. Doobie. 
Well, you put D-U-H, which is duh. Dubby. Oh, well, that's how they sent it to me. Totally dubby. I think it's totally dooby. <laughs> Slum Buns, Fanny Pimentel, Tasha Escobar, Ashley Ross, uh, David K, or the way this is, or the way the spaces are, Davey, I, I don't know. Cause so, so it could be ID, IDK, Davey, no, I, I don't know. I looked that one up. I looked that one up. I went okay. back to Patreon and I checked, I remember now, I checked a bunch of these yeah. names and that is correct. Okay. Davey, and I, I don't was know. like, Sure. People get weird with these. I mean, and that's part of the problem, too, when we're trying to do these is like there's so many obvious fake names. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, is this a fake or a real I know. I'm like, got it. <laughs> Treading lightly here. Danica Bug, Ashley Banks, Bree Lay, Ismail Robles Jr., Rebecca Noonkester, uh, Savvy Ray, Jessic Bartell, uh, Chris, Chris Jana, Aaron Daughter, and Ada Sawin. Thank you for your support. On the, on the Davy one, it's Davy. It, but it's not the, it's not I don't know. Davy it, IDK, which yeah. stands for I don't know. I know, but what if the last name is Idk? Idk? Davy ah. Idk. Mr. <laughs> Idk, your table is ready. <laughs> it could be. Could, listen, could listen, be. we know somebody with a last name that has no vowels in it. If it is, Davy, sorry, your fucking name sucks. <gasps> Come on, we're all thinking it. I wasn't. <laughs> when I typed it out, I thought, like, how do you say that? Idk? Idk? I don't know. You know if that's the real name. They've had to go their whole life be like, oh, it's actually pronounced Itka. Or they've had to correct people or just be like, oh, fuck it. I correct people on our name all the time. I know, but more, exactly. And we have Cummins, which actually is fairly phonetic. You can do Cummins, Cummins. But if you're, if yours is Itka, Itka, like you're, Idk. maybe it's like Icelandic or something. <laughs> I just want to defend them because I'm like, I just don't know. And I just don't want to be sitting here ripping on their name. Like I did. Yeah, and have it be their some name. Some people, some people know that. Some people have names. Listen, it's all subjective. Okay. One person's name is great to this person, and it sucks to another person. But some people's last names, most people are gonna be like, you got to, you drew the the bad straw. Fair. You got, you got a tough lot. We got a pretty funny, just really quick on names. Yeah. We got a pretty funny email over mm-hmm. at Time Suck, mm-hmm. and uh, it was like his guy's name is Richard mm-hmm. Party Dick Party. Yeah, but it's like it's like, but it's not pronounced party. But he's like, "Yep, I've been Dick Party my whole oh, life." Oh boy, Dick All Party, Dick Party. <laughs> I was like, "That your parents hate you." That was great. Uh, <sighs> that's great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the following Annabelles yeah. for supporting us to donate to kids, uh, ki- kids rock cancer. Joe Lamping, Christina Church, Daniel Hamby, Elizabeth Denton, Amanda Toombs, Jace. It's Bob. We had a baby. It's a boy. <laughs> Sarah Rossi, uh, Deanne and Kevin, Sonia and Chelsea Hellinger, Marianne Pyle, Kaylee Peters, Natalia Piera, Caleb Smart, Stephanie Hartzell, Elizabeth Cruz, Kitty Kitty Bang Bang, <laughs> Nick Kirton, Chris. Okay. This is a tough one. Okay. Aya Deshun, A I A H H, Aya. No idea. I'm really sorry. That's a very tricky one. Elisa Van Kirk, Tabitha Nicewander, Brittany Bitches, and Zachary Owen, <laughs> Memorisa, and Christopher Wallen. Nice. I was trying to think of which last names out of that list you just ran go best with dicks. I think Dick Nightwander. Dick Dick Party. Wasn't Dick Night wasn't Nightwander one of the last names? And then Peters, Dick Peters. And then Nice Wander. Nice Wander. Dick Nice Wander. Mm. Mm. Probably not as good as Dick Van Kirk. <laughs> Probably not as good as Dick Party. Oh, Dick man. Party's hard Ooh. to beat. Dick Pile. Oh! No, For the win. Thank you. Well, Dick Pile. Now, I will say yeah. I don't have any spooky shout outs this week. And How I come. Well, because we're catching up from camp and I am trying to catch up on scared to death emails. Mm. And I always start at the like the furthest date from now so that I'm doing them in order. Mm-hmm. So if it's like for a birth, if it's for like yeah. a birthday or yada, yada, yada. Yeah. So I'm like halfway through like 150 emails and there were none for this episode and I didn't want to like skip around. So okay. just no spoopy shout outs this week. I'll just a shout out uh, for, I love my wife, Lindsay. She's a beautiful woman. You have to say to Lindsay mm. from Dan. To Lindsay from Dan. You're a beautiful woman and I love you. That is so nice. Can mm-hmm. I, can I do one now? Yeah. To Dan from Lindsay. You're a weirdo. I love you. I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> Two dick piles from Dick Party. Dick Party. <laughs> I, it could only could be better if he had a daughter and he named her Virginia. Virginia then he'd have Party? Vagina Party. Oh, v- Vagina Party. Because mm-hmm. anybody named Virginia has at least been called Vagina once. 
What if you had two kids and you named one dick and just named your other vagina? That would be so cruel. Just if you named your daughter vagina party. Then, or you named your son vagina party. And then you could have tits party. Oh, man. You just the whole list. Butt party. Butthole party. Booty. Booty. The, Booty the, party. <laughs> the youngest <laughs> starts with dick party. Then it's vagina party. Nuts party. <laughs> taint, taint party. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Too far. Just goes to butthole party. <laughs> what, what was that last one? But, butthole party. <laughs> I, I heard puddle party and I was puddle. like, I don't know what that term means. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very confused. Ah. Uh, <laughs> That's oh, our weird show. Okay, sorry. Just, uh, this is what happens in our house. <laughs> Thanks for continuing to send in your personal tales of terror and your names. Actually, don't send your names to my story at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Uh, you can email us for everything else. Info at scaredtodeathpodcast.com. Thanks to Logan Keith uh, for his work on social media. Uh, to Logan again running badmagicmerch.com. Thanks to producer Olivia Lee for finding the second story today. Uh, I found the first. Thanks to Tyler C. producing Woo-hoo! today. The Suck Ranger. The Suck Ranger and the producer, producer's chair with Logan assisting. Uh, you can say hi, Tyler, if you want. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> That's not even his voice. Uh, hello, it's me. No, wait. Hello. What's that line original? now? It's me. Oh, uh, Is it me you're looking oh, for? I thought you were trying to do hello. Adele. <laughs> I can't even. Uh, no, just it wasn't Adele. Hello. But now I'm thinking about Lionel Richie. <laughs> hello. It's me. Uh, no. Uh, so, yeah. It's nice to have Tyler sitting in the chair. Thanks to Zach Cohen for custom sound bed creation. Heather Rylander for organizing the My Story emails. Book editor Drew Atana polishing and preparing listener stories now for book number four. Woohoo! Please get those stand-up tickets. DanCommons.tv. So many dates. Uh, where I'll be so much more inappropriate. Oh, so inappropriate. Enjoy your nightmares. Dicks, creeps, peepers, vaginas. Stop! All of you. Bye. Hope you're scared to death. Oh my gosh. If spirits threaten me in this place, fight water by water and fire by fire. Banish their souls into nothingness and remove their powers until the last trace. Let these evil beings flee through time and space. Evil may pass through, but hath no home here within scared to death. Bad Magic Productions. Oh, oh boy.